and welcome to the Amsterdam Film Show for November 2017. As always, we pick out a few of the new releases in the Netherlands, um, some lowbrow picks and some highbrow picks. There's going to be a bit of something for everyone. Uh, and we're also going to hear some film reviews. So welcome to the studio, Megan and David. Uh, now, these two have seen two similar sounding films on paper, the plot wise. Uh, they're snow set serial killer thrillers. Um, and let's see, Megan, what did you see? Um, I went to see Wind River, which uh, opened in cinemas in September, but I think it's still in cinemas now. Um, and yeah, David. <laughs> and I saw uh, The Snowman, based on the best selling book by Joe Nesbo, which just opened uh, this past week. <laughs> Wind River, um, what were your expectations going into the film? Well, I honestly had no idea what it was going to be about. I had just got to, just got to Amsterdam and just wanted to watch a film in English. <laughs> um, and it was, the first, it was like one of the only ones I could find uh, being shot at the eye. And so I kind of went into it with no expectations at all and was completely astounded by just kind of the amount of feeling that it elicited from me. Maybe wait for some backup. This isn't the land of backup, Jane. This is a land of your on your own. Oh, my God. Wolves don't kill unlucky deer. You kill the weak ones. You don't think I can make it? I'm out here. You cannot blink. Not once, not ever. Hey, FBI! Get your hand off that whip! About a young woman, the age of 18, who's a Native American and has been um, found uh, completely alone, uh, dead in snowy um, plains in an Indian reservation, uh, with no shoes on, and six miles from the nearest like road or town or anything. And so the um, the film is an exploration into sort of how she got there. Um, and from you know you might sort of initially think that it's a typical kind of. You know, we're just going to try and find out who the killer is. But it's a lot less about that and more sort of about um, bigger, broader structural sort of um, structural and political issues. Sort of a variety of themes from, you know, nature and sort of our powerlessness when confronted with, um, you know, like minus 20 degree uh, icy plains and um, you know, to sexism and racism, and just generally, um, you know, the abandonment of Native American communities from sort of white America, I guess. That's yeah. quite some different yeah, things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this, um, I remember uh, seeing this uh, back in September, and I had picked it out as one that I would like to see. I haven't, mm -hmm. uh, but because it was directed by this uh, Taylor Sheridan. So uh, he's a good director. He also did this recent uh, uh, Hell or High Water, which I had seen as well. Um, but you're right, it's got these kind of grander themes. There is a definite kind of drama being unveiled and whatever, you know, um, but behind it, these kind of uh, societal themes, um, it's a lot about recession and poverty and inequality. Um, uh, and it seems like it's coming through on this film too. Yeah. Um, what, is, what about all the violence um, and the kind of the scenes? How does that fit into this film? And is it bearable? I mean, a lot of it is shocking. And I think I often have an issue with violence, especially violence against women that I've seen in a lot of films, because I feel often it doesn't add much to the plot, but it's almost kind of just a, you know, people are sort of enticed by this kind of disturbing, so, and quite like perverted stuff. But I think it ties into a lot of like, the sinister things in our society, which- Yeah, it's, it's even called torture porn. Yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah, in yeah, yeah, books, weird yeah, stuff. Yeah. And I was kind of, um, you, you know, initially when you can tell in one of the scenes, you know, a rape scene that's gonna happen, uh, I was a bit like, Duh, like looking into it for my yeah. fingers, but I actually felt like it served some sort of purpose. I thought it was uh, good because even though um, it was a Native American community, there were white people living amongst them. And actually the main character who is this, um, he's a hunter of hunters. So he um, is hired by farmers and stuff to hunt like you know, wild lions and wolves and stuff that are going to kill their sheep. And he is a, a white American. 
and Taylor Sheridan actually made a point to make him dress with like a cowboy hat on. So it's kind of like he, this guy who has a lot of like close personal personal relationships with the Native Americans in the community. You know, he's their friend, he's their father, he's all this. Um, it's kind of yeah, it's just a, a lot more dynamic. It's not like yeah. us and them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, not divi not too divisive. Mm -hmm. uh, part played this uh, ranger type style guy played by Jeremy Renner. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> So, um, how did he do? Were there any standout acting uh, performances? Yeah, I... Hmm. I'm trying to think. I think the scenes where, you know, actors were really sort of like, you know, honed in on, it was always sort of done with this sort of sentimental piano music in the background. <laughs> and I was kind of a bit like, is this necessary? Like, But then again, you know, m maybe that's sort of a... Is it quite big in like a American like culture you, to get that sort of real emotion? Yeah, in? yeah. Those those moments on on screen that the actors want on screen yeah, to yeah, like yeah. reveal their character. Yeah, and, and like zoom in. But I don't think you knew, I actually thought his acting was the best when he was this sort of stoic, not really very responsive mm -hmm. kind of like very practical like we need to follow these trails in the snow kind of guy. I think that actually was a lot more like meaningful. They've got to give uh, some clips for the people at the awards ceremonies to show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 I guess. Elizabeth Olsen. Yeah, I thought she was really, really good. She played the sort of typical um, kind of um, out of her depth, but willing to like learn and grow on the job. Um, and also uh, slightly patronising towards Native Americans. Um, yeah, I thought she was really, really believable. I thought she did a really good job. Mm. And she wasn't just sort of um, there to develop the main characters at all. In fact, I think her, she as a character developed more than any of the male characters, which is quite um, different from a lot of films I see, whereas the women are usually sort of the, the props uh, mm. to get the male lead sort of more depth. Overall, what kind of person would you recommend to see this kind of film, uh, Wind River? Mm. Someone who's going to pay attention, first of all, because it's such an important story, I think. Um, you know, you know, I wouldn't recommend sitting on your couch with, you know, with your iPhone in your hand, kind of half watching it. Like, you've got to watch it and you've got to want to watch it. Um, but also someone who is, yeah, kind of oh, um, aware of the fact that they're going to come out and feel different from the way that they did when they went in. And it's like not necessary. It's, it's a feeling of like, wow, I've seen something very, very important. It's not a good feeling because it's really sad and really quite horrible. Um, so yeah, I guess someone who can just uh, take that. So on to The Snowman, uh, also a similar uh, film but different. Yeah, I mean this is, this is a you know, sort of classic serial killer uh, detective film. I mean, it doesn't have the political depth, although there's a little political minor thread in it, in it that may or may be leading us to the killer. But mostly it's it's more your classic uh, down and out policeman who starts in a world of hurt and then keeps getting hurt more and more throughout the film. Um, that's sort of typical crime fiction uh, setup. And yeah, with a serial killer and who you don't know who it is, it, so it's a kind of a whodunit in that sense, mm -hmm. you've got loads of suspects, everyone who pops up seems like they might be the one. It might be this dodgy sort of political character who has a taste for young women. It might be uh, this, <clears throat> it might be one of the cops. It might be, you know, there's all, everyone that, that, that pops up in the film is suddenly a possible suspect. Let's have a little taster. There's another missing woman. We got the missing person's call. Who's missing? Sylvia Otterson. I'm Sylvia Otterson. Why would someone report you missing? Um, unfortunately, the problem is, because the film is based on a book that's 500 pages long, and the film is only two hours, there's not enough time to develop these characters mm -hmm. to really understand who they are and why they might be the the killer. Yeah, yeah. You know, so from from having read lots of crime fiction, I knew who the killer was, 
very quickly <laughs> and then was dependent on kind of just enjoying the beautiful scenery and the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the tension between the main character and what's, what's going on in his life, his personal life, which is a lot... Those, that balance of that somehow is wrong in this film. It doesn't, mm -hmm. quite, it doesn't quite find... For instance, in a classic film like Silence of the Lambs... Yes. The, the development of Jodie Foster's character is so full in the in the film. Um, that's not so much the case with Harry Holland. He he starts out kind of down and out and on a park bench in the snow with an empty bottle of vodka before he goes into work. <laughs> so you know that things are not going well in his life, and then you find out he's got an ex girlfriend and all that kind of stuff. That's basically his backstory from the previous six novels that didn't get filmed. Uh, okay. um, you know, but so we start in 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 the middle of his story, as it were. Mm -hmm. But it's his tracking down a killer that uh, drives the movie forward, and unfortunately, it's not as exciting as it should be. And I, I did hear that the director said that part of the reason that the film got such bad reviews is we only got to film, uh, we didn't film ten to fifteen percent of the screenplay because we were rushed into production. Oh, blame the production company. Well, mm. even 10 to 15 percent is, is not that much of the screenplay to lose to, like, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's just one of those difficult things to adapt. The Scandinavian thrillers and crime fiction has been doing really well on TV with yes. long, extended, episodic stories. Yeah. And I think this probably would have benefited more from that kind of a treatment than trying to do it into a big blockbuster Hollywood-style film. Should have sent it to Netflix or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, uh, but it seems like a waste of a very good actor, Michael Fassbender. Well, yeah, I mean, he, 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 he's sort of, the movie's on his shoulders, mm -hmm. you know, but it's not so much of a waste of him as it is a waste of the minor characters played by people like uh, J.K. Simmons and, and Val Kilmer and Toby Jones and Chloe Gosh. Savini, all these great people in the movie who, you know, they're there for a second and then they're gone. You know, you just, you don't even have time to like, ooh, could he be, oh, where, where did he go? <laughs> he's gone, he's gone. You know, so, you know, I think those were the ones, that, the, the actors who are really wasted. That's why I think people expected so much from the movie with such a great cast and mm. were extremely disappointed. Now, I'd read some bad reviews before I went to see it. So, you know, my lower expectations mean, you know, uh, wasn't as bad as I expected, but it's not a great movie. Oh, but I guess, uh, although they cut the production, um, they probably still had some money to spend on the sh big shots and everything. Oh, it looks stunning. I mean, you know, s the snow, uh, snowy landscape of, of Scandinavia is, is a fantastic setting and looks great on the big screen. Um, the whole... But, but again, you know, bad weather where it's perfect cinematography, it really needs to be sustained by a good story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, um, I think it's Elmore Leonard, the old American crime fiction writer, who, who one of his rules about writing good crime fiction is never start with the weather. Oh. <laughs> and yet, in The Snowman, the first thing you see is the landscape of the snow and the weather. And the, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's got to be supported by the story. Yeah, I mean, it's a kind of creepy idea, the whole uh, snowman and head things. And, and there is also, probably from the trailer, it looks quite gratuitous and quite some violence. How difficult is that? How uh, is it like to watch uh, if you're sensitive to those kind of things? If you're, if, if you're sensitive to scenes of a violent nature, uh, it's probably not the film for you. Because, like I said, there is this rather nasty weapon um, and that's always good for a, you know, a serial killer, <laughs> that, the, that the method of, of death is something really disgusting. You're not going to tell us what it I, is. I, no, I think I'll save it, because uh, it's, 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 it's a unique little implement that I never, had never seen before and is used to quite strong effect <laughs> in the film. Oh, uh, sounds gruesome. Uh, yeah, it is, yeah it is, it's not a wood chipper, but you know, it has the same kind of effect on you. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Well, but that's the thing with serial killer stories. You gotta, you know, they gotta go out there and, and find the, you know, something new to, you know, in this, you've got snowmen, creepy enough, um, and then this implement. And when you find out why, the, the whole reason behind his kind of psychopathic behavior, yeah. it's almost a, a little bit of a disappointment, you know, a little bit of a letdown <laughs> hmm. compared to how, how strong the violence was. 
Would you recommend it? Not really, I guess. I, you know, if, if you got nothing to do on a Sunday afternoon, I say, and you like and you like crime fiction thrillers, yeah, go see it. Um, otherwise, you know, it'll be on TV soon. So that's uh, Wind River, which is still in the cinemas, uh, even though it came out in September. Quite a few screens: Pathé City, Film Helen, I Film Museum, Criterion, Lab One One One, and the movies. Um, and then also the Snowman is screening at the Film Helen and the Pathé Chain. <laughs> Also from the 2nd of November, uh, What Happened to Monday, which is a dystopian thriller starring Numi Rapace, an actress I really rate, um, and uh, Your Name, which is a fantasy animation, director screenwriter Makoto Shinkei. It's a random body switch between two teenage strangers, which leads to a magical connection, and though the two long to meet, it's far from simple. Um, now, this is one of those stunning Japanese animations. It's one of, uh, I think, 2016's most popular film in Japan. Um, and that's screening at the Film Hallen, the I Film Museum, Lab 111, Pathé de Munt, and the movies. But uh, there'll be mostly Dutch subtitles for this, uh, so that's a bit difficult. Um, but yeah, either of those take your fancy. Well. I've just been to the the Click Film Festival, oh, yeah. the Click um, Animation Festival. Yeah. I think the week before last, and so now I just have this like newfound uh, kind of admiration for any kind of animation. So I'm kind of intrigued to see your name. I think, and I do like always like a dystopian thriller. So, yes. Yeah, the um, what happened to Monday is interesting because I uh, if you see some uh, the trailer, uh, Nomi replete. Rep Rapace is playing a character, but she's playing multiple characters, but there's one of them, I think, for the days of the week, and Monday is missing or something. Uh, yeah. But there's, there'll be moments on screen where there's like six Nomi Rapaces uh, playing, her char playing different characters. So also from the 9th of November, big release here, big budget, Murder on the Orient Express which is a film that's been made before, probably TV and film versions of, I think, uh, about it. It's got the most enormous list of A-list stars ever. So you've got Kenneth Branagh, Penelope Cruz, um, what's the name, Judith, Judith, no, Judy Dench, Judy Dench. that's <laughs> it. Um, oh, I, if I had named all the stars, we could go on forever. Um, but it's also directed by Kenneth Branagh, Sir Kenneth Branagh, I think. Yeah, uh, 13 stranded strangers on a long train ride and Poirot, the Belgian detective, weeds out the murderer yet again. But ouch, it's only had two stars from The Guardian's Peter Gradshaw. Yeah, mm. you know, if this is classic Agatha Christie and I, I'm old enough to remember the original big Hollywood version which had just as many stars. Ingrid Bergman won an Oscar for her bit part in it. And uh, it's just, it's, 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 tailor-made for movie stars. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine what a, an audience today is going to think about mm. it. <laughs> I mean, that's it. It's been done before. It's kind of, Agatha Christie is dated. No matter how much you try to modernise her, I think uh, it always remains dated. And for me, it just seems like, does this story really need to be retold again? You know? I must say, this one is one of, I, no spoilers, but it is one of her better twists. Okay. At the end. Mm, but yeah. then again, who knows? They might have changed it. Yeah. Right. So have they have they tried to completely modest, uh, modif uh, modernize this one? No, I mean it's still period set, um, so there's, there's they can't really do much about that mm -hmm. particularly. So you know it's always this Agatha Christie set in what 1930s or so, um, and those kind of class distinctions between a maid and the uh, people she works with, and and Poirot's nearly always the same and stuff like that. And it's that's the difficult thing, you know, this kind of bizarre French detective. Uh, it's it's a kind Belgium. of character. Your Belgium, yeah, Belgium, what's going on, right, Belgium. You know, we've seen it before, it's like, it's not anything new, that story, it's, um, but they've probably, you know, they've had a lot of money to spend on this. And I'm sure they had a lot of fun filming it. That's true, but in my, that's what I think, I think in my view, it's mostly a vehicle for Kenneth Branagh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excuse the pun. <laughs> uh, but it's screening at Outkike and the Pathé Chain, at least, um, it'll probably go lots more screens than that. Also from the 9th of November, The Square, uh, satire, director Ruben Ostlund, uh, writer Ruben Ostlund also, 
uh, it's from the director of uh, Tourist, uh, which was quite well received. Um, and it's a satirical drama reflecting our times about the sense of community, moral courage and the affluent person's need for egocentricity in an increasingly uncertain world. Now that description, taken I think from IMDb or something, says nothing to me. It's basically a satire on the art world, basically. Uh, so um, I looked, I watched the trailer, it does seem very funny, but it's a foreign language film, so um, there will be Dutch subtitles, but there is some English spoken in the film. One of the major actresses is uh, Elizabeth Moss. Um, so if you, if you feel like a challenge, you can see this. And like I say, I think it's one of the more interesting films in November. Yeah, and mid-November, there's a week where all the new releases, it's just, it's really hard to pick one out. So from uh, the week of 16th of November, uh, all the films have seemed like real humdingers to me. Um, so you've got Justice League, which is the latest offering from the stable. Uh, Ghost Story, which uh, critics love, but audiences may struggle to embrace. It's a slow-moving Poetic film meditation on what we leave behind when we die, star starring Rooney Mara um, and also Casey Affleck. And then Suburbicon. It's directed by George Clooney, starring Matt Damon, Julianne Moore, Oscar Isaac and more. Uh, towards the end of the month, we have Battle of the Sexes, a comedy drama. Um, and it's got Emma Stone, Steve Carell and Andrea, Andrea Riesborough. It's the true story of the 1973 tennis match between world number one Billie Jean King and the ex-champ and serial hustler Bobby Riggs. Also from the 29th of November, The Killing of a Sacred Deer. It's from director-screenwriter Yorgos Lanthimos, who was also uh, behind the film The Lobster. It's starring Nicole Kidman, Alicia Silverstone and Colin Farrell. Now, Stephen, a charismatic surgeon, is forced to make an unthinkable sacrifice after his life starts to fall apart when the behaviour of a teenage boy he has taken under his wing turns sinister. Ooh. Now, The Lobster I've seen, uh, and I must admit, <laughs> I didn't finish it. Uh, and I thought it was kind of good, but it got really boring. Uh, and it was really good acting, but it's, it's kind of one of these absurdist dramas. And like a lot of people say, Colin Farrell kind of delivers his really deadpan performance. And I think he's going to be doing a similar job in this film as well. Uh, is this film on your radar at all? Uh, the title, because the title is kind of unforgettable. I mean, The Killing of a Sacred Deer mm -hmm. just sounds fascinating. Yeah. But for the rest, I, I didn't see The Lobster. And so, but I, I would see almost anything with Colin Farrell. <gasps> oh, I quite like the description, it looks good, but yeah, the fact that this guy also directed The Lobster, I'm a bit more cautious now, because I just <laughs> thought that was... I came out and I was like, why did I just waste <laughs> that much of my life? He had yeah. really good reviews! Yeah, yeah. I did, I, everyone gets obsessed with this whole, like, quirky, arty sort of, and I'm like, maybe I'm just a bit too conventional, but it's too much for me. <laughs> Okay, so festivals and screenings in Amsterdam, there's always a lot. Uh, this month we've really just picked out IDFA. Uh, there's a lot more going on, uh, but if we got paid for the show, I'd probably cover all of them, but we don't. So I'm just going to talk about IDFA. Uh, it's the documentary film festival from the 15th to the 26th of November. Uh, it's all over town, basically, and it's been going on for years. Yes, I remember seeing the very first edition of IDFA. It no started, way! It started just after I moved to Amsterdam in the late 80s, yeah. Wow! Uh, so how's it grown for you? Oh, it's, it's amazing because I, I, I was covering it a lot for uh, Radio Netherlands when I worked there. And, yeah. you know, I would go there and for 10 days I would just see, you know, d several films per day and do as many interviews as I could with directors. It was fantastic. It always, I always saw the most horrifying, funny, touching, just the whole range of documentary work and a lot of... European work that you wouldn't see normally, be, you know, because everything is international, so it all had English subtitles back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I I miss it. I haven't I haven't been in the last few years, but I really miss that sort of intensive immersion in the documentary world and just seeing such a wide range of stories. But it's absolutely huge. Yeah. Uh, and the interesting thing about Info uh, is it's not really just for the industry and the press. There's a lot of general public going to see the films. The general public, they often get sold out. No, that's, I think that's the biggest change over the years. When At first it was a lot of industry people and film people, you know, just 
and press going to see it. Um, but now with the public screenings, you know, from early in the morning until late at night, and then the Audience Choice Awards, and then these big screenings, especially for the most popular films, run one after another on a full day. They do, they sell out. It's important, you know, to get the program early and decide what you want to go and order tickets because a lot of screenings sell out now. If you want to know more, uh, visit idva.nl. And don't forget the Cine Expat series, uh, which is at the Cine Centre. They have two screenings per month of foreign language films, but with English subtitles, new releases. And one of the films is 12th of November on Sunday, uh, and it's The Square. So thanks for joining us on the Amsterdam Film Show for November. We'll be back next month. Thank you, David and Megan, for oh, joining us. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> and if you see any of these films at the cinema, and if you disagree with any of uh, our viewpoints, um, or if you see a different film, uh, do let us know. We'd love to share your reviews on the show. Uh, so that's at info at broadcastamsterdam.nl. Uh, get in touch with us. And we've also got links to some of the films and screenings we've mentioned um, at broadcastamsterdam.nl.